after decades of foreign intervention, instability, and government corruption, the Guatemalan people have finally elected an anti-corruption activist to be their next president. But as the ruling class elites fear exposure and consequences for their own corrupt behaviors, efforts are already being made to interfere with a peaceful transition of power, with government forces calling Bernardo Arevalo's landslide victory into question. The response? The Guatemalan people are protesting. Hello and welcome to the Modern Context Podcast. I'm your host, Yasmin Aliyah Khan, and if you're listening to this on the release date, October 27th, it is my birthday. I'm 35 years old today, which is fun. Is it just me or do we all just get a little introspective around our birthdays? I've never really been very concerned with getting older or anything like that. I feel like if I eat right and drink some water, get enough sleep and, you know, wear sunblock, I'll be okay. But somehow, being closer to 40 than 30 hits a little different. I've noticed that I've been a little bit more withdrawn lately, not so much with my actual real-life friends and family, but definitely regarding my presence on social media. If you follow me on social media, first of all, thank you very much, but also, sorry for not being better at it. I'm not going to go on a whole anti-social media rant, although I certainly could. But suffice to say that there are things that I would rather do instead of scrolling on my phone, and I've been doing them. I had some family in from out of town, so I hung out with them. I went to Austin a couple of times. I saw the killers at Formula One. That was a lot of fun. I painted my dining room, including the ceiling, which was quite a workout. Uh, I baked a cheesecake, and for my birthday, you know, I'm just going to spend it with some friends and family. And speaking of my friends... One of my best, best friends is from Guatemala. We met in eighth grade in our sewing class, and we have been best friends ever since. So a big part of why I'm covering this topic for this episode is because a couple of weeks ago, I get a text telling me that my friend is stuck in Guatemala. She was down there visiting some family, but while she was down there, protests broke out in the capital, Guatemala City. The airport was inaccessible, so she was stuck down there a little bit longer than she had planned to be. Everything was fine, by the way. Everyone's home safe now. And I've actually been to Guatemala, too. It was great. Uh, We all went back, uh, I think it was last year, when this friend got married. We started in Antigua, which is where the wedding happened. And then after the wedding, a few of us went over to the lake, Lake Atitlan, which is said to be one of the most beautiful lakes in the whole wide world, and I'm certainly not going to contest that claim. It's one of the most perfect places I've ever been. The people were great, the culture was beautiful, and the history is super interesting. Now, if you know anything about this part of the world, you probably already know that, yes, we will be discussing banana republics. Actual banana republics, not whatever Ted Cruz tries to say is a banana republic these days. And yes, we will be talking about U.S. intervention in the Central American nation. Intervention that, predictably, doesn't go so well, at least not for the Guatemalans, and intervention that has had lasting repercussions to this day. So, let's get started. Some quick background, Guatemala is located in Central America, just south of Mexico. It's also bordered by Belize, Honduras, and El Salvador, along with coastlines along both the Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. The terrain is quite mountainous, but some of those mountains are actually dormant or active volcanoes. When we were there, we kept hearing what sounded like thunder in the distance, but we soon realized that wasn't thunder, it was actual volcanic rumbling. Actually, the capital used to be in Antigua, but in the 1700s, it was destroyed by volcanoes, so the capital was then moved to Guatemala City. Guatemala is the country with the most volcanic activity in Central America, and one of those volcanoes surrounding Antigua, El Fuego, is currently rumbling. It has been for a while. It erupted at the end of last year, just a few months after I was there, and it just had another significant episode between April and June of this year, and it's still going. In 2018, a major eruption left approximately 200 dead and another 2 to 300 missing. And speaking of volcanoes, Lake Atitlan is located in the Sierra Madre mountain range, and it's the deepest lake in all of Central America. The lake was created by a huge volcanic eruption around 80,000 years ago, and it's surrounded by mountains and cliffside. 
The area surrounding the lake is full of local villages, and you typically would get from one village to another by boat. As I mentioned, it's commonly referred to as one of the most beautiful lakes in the world, and it's often compared to Lake Como in Italy. Unfortunately, I have not been to Lake Como, so I can't personally validate that comparison, but hopefully that'll change one day. The villages and the people around the lake are influenced by the Mayan culture, but thanks to the Spanish conquistadors, they also speak Spanish. In fact, Mayan culture is big throughout Guatemala. The land is and was the center of Mayan civilization, and many tourists travel to Guatemala to visit the ancient Mayan sites. Today, the majority of Guatemala's indigenous population is descended from Mayans, so the culture is still very much present within the greater Guatemalan culture, with Mayan traditions even working their way into the people's modern practice of Catholicism. But the Mayans weren't exactly treated with the respect they deserved, and that trend has persisted from the time the first Spaniards set foot in Guatemala to this current modern era. As we know all too well here in the United States, the Americas have long endured the plague of European colonialists. Today, the U.S. population is primarily comprised of the descendants of colonial settlers and immigrants, and in Central and South America, the evidence of Spanish colonization is literally everywhere. As is usually the case, whenever outsiders move in, the native populations are often displaced, demeaned, and disregarded. The first Spanish conquistador arrived in Guatemala in 1524 from Mexico, Pedro de Alvarado. After having already dealt with the Aztec in Mexico, here he would acquaint himself with the Maya. He was known for his cruelty even while he was alive amongst his own contemporaries, and he had a tendency to lose interest in a territory after he had conquered it. In other words, he wasn't exactly known for his governing skills. He was referred to as an insatiable despot in his time, which I guess is a compliment if you're in the business of seizing lands and oppressing people. And his oppression wasn't just limited to the indigenous people, he was cruel to other Spaniards too, and he was often dismissive of the crown which sought to manage him from way, way, way across the sea. But with Alvarado's arrival, Spain was now in control of Guatemala, and it would retain control until 1821 when Guatemala declared its independence. At the time, European-born Spaniards were considered the elite ruling class in the region, with Guatemalan-born Spaniards just beneath them in class. Those second-class citizens demanded more rights and recognitions within Guatemala's governance, so they overthrew their European rulers. The indigenous people, descendants of the Maya, were predictably at the bottom of the totem pole. So following independence, Guatemala had a brief two-year stint as part of the Mexican Empire, and then it became part of the United Provinces of Central America, which consisted of Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Honduras, and Costa Rica. However, things for the Maya were even worse during this time than they were under colonial rule. They were put to work for the ruling class, which largely consisted of Catholic landowners. Dissension between groups in the Confederation started to fray the bonds between the nations, and a cholera outbreak in 1837 pitted the Catholic conservatives against the liberals, who at that point had taken control of the government and were therefore to blame for all of the cholera, naturally. A conservative rebel leader and pig farmer, Rafael Carrera, would seize Guatemala City in 1838, marking the de facto end of the United Provinces. By 1844, Carrera was made president of Guatemala, and he would retain power for nearly 20 years until his death. During his time as president, he made several attempts to restore the union, but when that didn't work, he would work to install sympathetic conservative leaders in the former union states. He enacted several conservative reforms in Guatemala, undoing the work of his liberal predecessors, but he's actually perhaps best known for ceding control of Belize to the British. In the 1870s, Justo Rufino Barrios took over as president a wealthy, liberal, young guy who owned a coffee plantation. He would rule more as a dictator than as a president, but he did work to modernize several industries in the nation, including its infrastructure, its education, and its banking system. It was also under Barrios that Guatemala would become the major coffee producer and exporter that it is today. 
But then, Barrios was ultimately killed in battle when he tried, unsuccessfully, to annex El Salvador. That happens. Following Barrios' death, wealthy land-owning families took control of the nation's economy, giving land and commercial rights to foreign companies, including the Boston-based United Fruit Company, which moved into Guatemala at the turn of the 20th century. By the 1930s, the UFC would monopolize the agriculture industry in Guatemala, becoming the largest employer in Central America and the largest landowner in Guatemala. It even ran the Guatemalan Postal Service, and with its corporate authority, the UFC exploited its workers and devastated the land with its lack of crop diversity. With one corporation holding so much influence over an entire nation's resources and operations, these Central American nations came to be known as banana republics. During this time, Guatemala was under the leadership of Manuel Estrada Cabrera, a dictator who favored elites and displayed a disdain for laborers. He forced the indigenous people to work for the UFC, and he allowed the UFC to operate freely under his dictatorship. Because of his cooperation, the UFC was allowed to thrive with unimpeded support from the government and military. Meanwhile, the country itself was suffering from economic decline, its currency was being devalued, and its people were being overlooked. Estrada Cabrera was eventually overthrown from government in 1920, following protests from university students against government corruption and injustice towards the indigenous and working class. Jumping ahead about a decade, President Jorge Ubico was elected in a race where he was the only candidate, and he set out to crack down on corruption in government, passing a probity law that would require all public officials to disclose their assets both before and after leaving office. And while that sounds pretty good, there was no one to monitor his own asset acquisition, so he bought land across the country at incredibly low prices that he conveniently set himself. He also continued to give the UFC free reign over the Guatemalan land and workers, and he compared himself to Napoleon and Hitler. It was under Ubico's totalitarian regime that military officials were given government positions, and the UFC would obtain control of Guatemala's railroad, electricity, and port facilities. After Ubico was overthrown, a liberal president was elected in 1945, Juan José Arevalo. He was the first democratically elected president in Guatemala, marking the beginning of what came to be known as the Guatemalan Revolution. It was at this time that things started to look up for Guatemalans. Even as he survived a whopping 25 coup attempts from conservatives, Arevalo managed to set up public health, social security, and a Bureau of Indigenous Affairs in Guatemala. By 1946, women had the right to vote. By the time he left office in 1951, he had drafted a new constitution, raised the minimum wage, and introduced literacy programs. Today, his son, Bernardo Arevalo, is Guatemala's embattled president-elect. Now, taking over for Arevalo in 1951 was Colonel Jacobo Arbenz, and he continued to champion the rights of workers in Guatemala and to challenge the political and economic dominance of the UFC. He implemented several agrarian reforms, most notably expropriating large swaths of unused land from the UFC, land that had been given to them by Cabrera and Ubico, and giving it to the peasants for them to farm. He sought to help small, independently owned farms to become productive and profitable, which sounds great. I mean, I guess it depends on who you ask. Monopolies don't like to be challenged, and our Benz was bad for the big banana business. The United Fruit Company appealed to the Truman administration in the United States, complaining that they were losing money with this communist in power. At the height of the Red Scare and McCarthyism, and at the start of the Cold War, Truman approved a coup in Guatemala to install a more conservative leader who would be more cooperative with both the United States and United Fruit. When Eisenhower took office, he was even more committed to eradicating communism abroad, not to mention his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, had interests in the UFC. That guy now has an airport named after him. <laughs> 
After a 10-day siege that involved bombings of Guatemala City, naval blockades, and anti-government propaganda campaigns, Carlos Castillo Armas was installed as the new leader of Guatemala. A decade of democratic reforms were quickly undone by Armas, and Arben supporters were succinctly dealt with, either arrested, exiled, or killed. The UFC was allowed to maintain its dominance in the region, and it resumed its modus operandi of exploiting the indigenous people. But revolutions don't die so easily. Revolutions are ideological. They take more than military force to eradicate. In fact, the CIA coup would only serve to radicalize rebels against the illegitimate government, the United States, and the UFC. A rebel armed forces group was formed, and by 1960, Guatemala was engaged in a deadly civil war that would last 36 years. Knowing what we know now regarding the CIA-backed coup, the military dictatorship, the UFC, etc., calling it a civil war feels like a bit of a misnomer, doesn't it? Guatemala had managed to correct its course after suffering centuries of colonial rule and then decades of dictatorship. The democratic revolution of the 1940s and 50s had been hard fought and hard won, but it wasn't even given a chance to thrive because foreign interests didn't allow the people the dignity of governing themselves. After the coup, the United States didn't leave the country. It was still there, essentially propping up the puppet government that it had installed. It had successfully destabilized the nation for its own interests, and when it caught international backlash for its actions, the U.S. then attempted and failed to find links between the Arbenz government and the Soviets. Meanwhile, the Guatemalan people, after having been given a glimpse of what life could have been, had that dream ripped from their hands as they were plunged back into a life of subservience and disrespect. The Guatemalan Civil War was one of the deadliest Latin American wars during this time. Over the course of more than three decades, more than 200,000 Guatemalans, mostly indigenous, were killed. Thousands more went missing, an estimated 100,000 mostly Mayan refugees fled to Mexico, and to make matters worse, an earthquake in 1973 left a million people homeless. The U.S., for all of its pro-democracy rhetoric that it would hide behind throughout the Cold War, was hesitant to support actual democracy abroad, especially when it didn't serve U.S. economic or political interests. In the years following the coup, voting rights were stripped from roughly 75% of the population, and government opposition was suppressed by secret police and military operations. Ironically, leftist ideologies would actually gain popularity within the country in the years following the coup as a direct result of the U.S. involvement. By the way, the coup actually did little to help the United Fruit Company. With the country now incredibly unstable, the UFC saw profits and stock valuations decline. The Eisenhower administration, which had enacted the coup initially at the UFC's behest, busted up the monopoly, and by 1972, the company was out of Guatemala. By the 1980s, General Efrain Rios Montt, an evangelical Christian conservative, became president-slash-dictator, coming to power by coup, and he oversaw some of the worst brutality Guatemalans would suffer during the Civil War era. He would kill thousands of people from hundreds of villages, mostly indigenous men, claiming that they had communist or rebel sympathies. Rios Montt was deposed by General Oscar Humberto Mejia Victorias after just one year in power, but Victorias wasn't much better. He displaced thousands of people, moving them to what he called model villages in remote areas, but the villages were heavily patrolled and monitored by the military. It was during this time that violence in the country had become so bad that the U.S. could no longer reasonably justify its involvement in all of these human rights abuses. So, it finally, 30 years after the coup, cut off military support to Guatemala. And then, without U.S. military support, Guatemala was finally able to elect a non-military president. They elected a civilian, who was more or less a lame duck, with little progress being made regarding power balances in the country. The 90s saw a few quick changeovers of power, with one president attempting unsuccessfully to establish a dictatorship, and by 1996, under President Alvaro Arzu, a peace agreement was finally negotiated and the Civil War officially ended.
Now, with United Fruit and the United States more or less out of Guatemala, the country found itself in a post-Civil War Reconstruction era. It had lost hundreds of thousands of its citizens to the war, again mostly indigenous people, either from having been killed, disappeared, or forced to flee. The villages still suffered from poverty, lack of opportunity, lack of education, and lack of adequate medical facilities, and the next couple of decades would see bad faith politicians embracing and attempting to conceal corruption once in office. One president, Alfonso Portillo, was caught using the U.S. banking system to divert as much as $500 million from the Guatemalan treasury. From 2016 to 2020, the Trump years in the U.S., a comedian was elected president of Guatemala on the promise that he was not corrupt. Spoiler alert, he did turn out to be corrupt, so corrupt in fact that he destroyed the international anti-corruption body that uncovered his corruption. Currently, the president of Guatemala is Alejandro Yamate, who took over in 2020 as the world was plunged into a pandemic of unprecedented scale. I was actually supposed to go to Guatemala in 2020, not 2022, but I remember that Guatemala was one of the first countries to explicitly bar travel from the United States. Not that I blame them, but at the time we still didn't really know the extent of what was coming. Still, he has been criticized for his overall management of the COVID crisis. Among other things, he's faced some challenges since being in office. After a stint of corrupt leaders, many Guatemalan voters expressed concern that the only people running for office were those hoping to profit or otherwise benefit from the role. And others said that Yamate was simply the best candidate that was available to them. In the few years he's been president, he has come under suspicion for corruption, which is putting it lightly as he's actually been referred to as one of the country's most corrupt leaders, and actually, a journalist who accused him of corruption was arrested in 2022. Assassinations, forced exile, and threats of violence or financial ruin plague the political opponents and social leaders fighting for indigenous and environmental rights, among other things, and he himself recently survived an assassination attempt. As a conservative Christian, his administration increased punishments for abortions and they banned sex education in schools. He's vocally against the LGBTQ community. Crime has noticeably increased on his watch, as well as emigration to the United States. And wealth inequality has become rampant, creating a desperate situation for Guatemalans. What else? Uh, he's also pro-death penalty. So Guatemalans are more than justified in being frustrated with bad, corrupt leadership. This time, they elected a familiar name with a familiar platform, Bernardo Arevalo, an anti-corruption candidate who is hoping to follow in the footsteps of his Democratic Revolution-era father, former President Juan José Arevalo. But after winning the August election in a landslide, efforts are already being made by the ruling class elites to delegitimize his win, prompting protests throughout the country. Arevalo, who is the general secretary for the Seed Party, is a center-left slash progressive party that was founded in 2017. In 2019, when Yamate was elected president, the Seed Party candidate, Thelma Aldana, was a jurist who had served as the president of the Guatemalan Supreme Court and as attorney general, and she had been active in the fight against government corruption. She was the front runner in the race until she was disqualified on unfounded and unproven claims that she herself was corrupt. There was a paperwork discrepancy with her running mate, and they used that to remove her from the race entirely. Of course, she had also pledged to reinstate CSIG, the anti-corruption outfit, if and when she was elected president, so I guess they figured it'd be easier to just get rid of her ahead of the race rather than have to deal with her after the fact. Anyway, she's now living in exile in El Salvador. Now, President-elect Arevalo is dealing with similar efforts to discredit his campaign and destroy his party. The Attorney General's office has already raided the party's election offices and seized materials in an effort to find incriminating documents. Nothing so far has been found. Arevalo says there are no legal reasons for him to not take the presidency in January, but they'll try to find one anyway. Alternatively, if they are unsuccessful in blocking his presidency, 
they might try to discredit or even dissolve his party so that he would essentially be unable to get anything done during his term. So since the beginning of October, Guatemala City has seen protesters in the streets demanding that the man they elected as president be allowed to serve as president. The protesters blocked over 100 roadways in their demonstrations, and they're calling for the resignation of the attorney general and others believed to be behind the election raids. Even the United States has weighed in on the current situation, accusing Attorney General Maria Consuelo Porras of, quote, significant corruption. If Alevaro is unable to serve as president, the people will be ruled by a leader who represents the minority of the population. But that's not anything new for Guatemalans. After the indigenous Maya population suffered years of genocide under former rulers, they still make up nearly half of the Guatemalan population. However, they've consistently been intentionally overlooked and exploited by their leaders, and they are scarcely represented within the government. Now, part of that probably has something to do with the fact that a large percentage of that population is illiterate or uneducated, thanks again to the government continually choosing to exploit them for labor rather than educate them or otherwise invest in their communities. For a while, they even had their rights to vote revoked. Today, nearly 80% of the indigenous population lives in poverty. Now, demonstrations are still happening in Guatemala, with increasingly loud calls for the attorney general or others in the existing administration to step down. Several major roadways are being blockaded, and protests are expected to continue into the coming days. So far, there haven't been any violent clashes between protesters and armed forces, but if the blockades continue, and if they spread across the country, further outside of the cities, and maybe even into the ports on the coast, there is a chance we might see some violence. However, the Guatemalan government knows that the world is watching them, so they might be on their best behavior. For our part, here in the U.S., we're threatening sector-based sanctions against Guatemala if they don't adhere to the democratic process. But you have to wonder if they don't roll their eyes at us a little bit. Economic and political cooperation between Guatemala and the U.S. is important because the U.S. needs to work closely with Guatemala regarding the issue of immigration. And it's funny, isn't it? Central America sees the most emigration out of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. What do those three countries have in common? They were all at some point intentionally destabilized for American gain and corporate greed. They were all banana republics. And that wasn't happening very long ago. 20 years after the U.S. backed a coup in Guatemala, we did the same thing in El Salvador. The United Fruit Company is still around. They've just rebranded. Problems don't go away on their own. But it's duplicitous, to put it nicely, to intentionally wreak havoc in someone's country and then chastise them when they struggle to put it all back together. And going forward, this will likely become more of a problem for the U.S., the U.S. tends to portray itself as Captain America, the world's superhero who's there to save every smaller nation from the communist Red Skull or from the terrorists or from whoever they need saving from. But other countries are now understanding how insincere those motives often are. They're now seeing and living through the consequences of bad faith U.S. interference from decades prior. So it's becoming more and more difficult to reconcile the pristine Chris Evans Captain America imagery with decades of instability, bloody civil wars, and more. Maybe the U.S. will actually have to walk the walk eventually. Or maybe our politicians will continue to just say what needs to be said in the moment that it needs to be said without much concern for optics. Either way, it is good that now, today, the U.S. and other nations are reminding the Guatemalan government that they've got eyes on them and that there will be consequences for violations to election integrity. But the Guatemalan people just might need to keep this up until January. All right, guys, that wraps up this episode. I'm going to go do birthday things with my Guatemalan bestie and a few others. And I hope you all have a great weekend too, however you end up spending it and whoever with.
Be sure to come back and join us in the next episode of the ModCon Pod. I would love to see you again. In the meantime, I would love to hear from you. Reach out to the show at hello at modconpod.com with any suggestions or questions you might have for us. Also, don't forget to follow and subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Find us on YouTube and tell your friends all about us. And of course, thank you for listening. I'm so glad that you've made it this far and I can't wait to see you next time. Cheers. Modern Context is a Rabble Babble production produced by Brandon Morgan and recorded live in Houston, Texas. For Modern Context, I'm your writer and host, Yasmin Aliyah Khan.